Welcome to Natsec Tech, a podcast from the Special Competitive Studies Project. I'm Jean Meserve. The Department of Defense is a big, lumbering bureaucracy with hierarchies and rules and a devotion to legacy weapons systems that make innovation and transformation challenging. But a little-known group within DOD has had success making the Pentagon more nimble, more open to adopting the new technologies developed in the private sector, something that many argue is critical to the future of U.S. military power. A new book, Unit X, How the Pentagon and Silicon Valley Are Transforming the Future of War, tells the story. It is co-authored by Raj Shah and Christopher Kirchhoff, the two men who launched the unit. Christopher Kirchhoff joins me now. He is an expert in emerging technology who has led teams for President Obama, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and former Google CEO Eric Schmidt, who is also founder of the Special Competitive Studies Project. Chris, great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. The cover of your book features images of an iPhone and an F-35. Why? What does this represent? You know, uh, it's really interesting. In this nation, we have uh, almost two completely separate systems of technological production. We have one for the military, uh, and then we have one for consumer products. And uh, the you know uh, F thirty five is a, a illustration of this on the on the cover of Unit X because its design, as sophisticated as it is, as amazing an aircraft it is, its design was finalized in two thousand and one, but it didn't actually start flying until twenty sixteen, and of course a lot had changed in technology in their intervening years. So the purpose behind Defense Innovation Unit, which uh, Ash Carter, Secretary Ash Carter, uh, founded was to try and bring those two different systems closer together, to take uh, the traditional one for the military, uh, which is often expensive, and uh, and make it move faster, and then to take full advantage of that other stream of technology that the Pentagon um, has historically not focused on. Ukraine is a perfect example of where this is happening, correct? It's an incredible uh, laboratory uh, where uh, uh, I think you can really catch glimpses of uh, what the future of war will be. And one of the most dramatic developments that I've been following closely happened just last month. So Ukraine is clearly the first uh, drone war, and um, we provided the Ukrainian military 31 of our most advanced battle tanks, the M1A1 uh, battle tank. Now, you know this is an incredibly sophisticated tank. It's the best not only in our arsenal, but certainly in all of NATO. And the Ukrainians have had to evacuate those tanks from the front because a quarter of them were destroyed by Russian kamikaze drones. So, you know, if you look at that in the history of mechanized warfare, it could mean that a century of, of mechanized warfare that began in World War I is coming to a close because of advances in uh, drone technology. And a lot of innovation is taking place on the fly in Ukraine. It's one of the amazing things to watch over there, isn't it, from a military perspective? My co-author, uh, Rod Shaw, and I got a chance to visit Ukraine last October, and uh, it was incredibly impressive to be led in Kiev and also uh, the city of Lviv uh, through a number of almost garage kind of uh, uh, you know workstations. It, it, you know, these are young companies that uh, literally are innovating um, in sort of hidden, out of the way places, and uh, they're using. Um, commercial technology to build an extremely high volume of drones and also to innovate very rapidly on those drones so that they can uh, still be successful against um, increasingly sophisticated Russian jamming that's uh, typically jamming uh, GPS signals, uh, but also interfering uh, with the drones in, in other ways. And so there, there is an incredible battle going on now uh, between the maker of drones and uh, the defender uh, against drones uh, uh, with incredibly sophisticated electronic warfare uh, systems. Are you suggesting that legacy systems, the big tanks and the aircraft carriers that our military has depended on for decades, are you suggesting that they will not have a place in the future or that they need to be integrated with the new technology? Uh, Gene, that's a great question. And the way we talk about it in the book is we're in an era of, of hybrid war right now, where you're seeing um, these classic set pieces of uh, military technology, tanks, 
uh, trenches, uh, uh, missiles uh, being used in combination with a whole layer of new digital technologies, whether that's uh, you know satellite communications. Uh, like Starlink, uh, you know, uh, which is essentially the backbone of, of a lot of Ukrainians' command and control. They're using encrypted apps on, on smartphone to uh, communicate. So, so you're seeing on the battlefield today in Ukraine, um, legacy weapon systems working in tandem, uh, being made more effective by and at times defeated by uh, this whole new wave of technology uh, that uh, Ukraine is known for, of course, the, the drones uh, uh, most specifically. And the Russians are paying attention to this. The Chinese are paying attention to this. A lot of people are learning from what's happening in Ukraine, correct? I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's unquestionable now that the tactics being pioneered in Ukraine uh, are going global. And uh, we're seeing glimpses of that in other parts of the world. So, for example, um, during the October 7th invasion by Hamas of Israel, Hamas was able to successfully defeat this incredibly sophisticated border wall that the Israelis had erected over years uh, by taking quadcopters and using them to drop charges on the generators that powered the surveillance towers. Similarly, Hezbollah now in the north of Israel is using a combination of cruise missiles and, and loitering munitions to effectively depopulate the north of Israel. The Israelis have had to evacuate 85,000 of their citizens south of the border because they can't be effectively defended. Uh, you know, at the same time, in the Red Sea, um, we're seeing Houthi rebels uh, use autonomous uh, sea drones to harass the 12% of global shipping that, that passes through the Red Sea. So this technology is going global and uh, going global very quickly. So that's where we are now. Let's go back in time to when Unit X was formed. That was 2015, am I correct? Yes, 2015 was uh, when Secretary Carter opened the office and uh, Raj and I became its leaders in 2016 when he revamped it and gave it uh, a new set of tools and authorities. You were one of the first leaders of this unit. The job wasn't easy, was it? You were confronted with what you call antibodies. Explain <laughs> what they are. Well, you know, when you rewind the tape and go back to 2016, the wave of uh, new defense tech companies that we know today, Anderol, uh, uh, Shield AI, um, they just didn't exist. And uh, one of the reasons why they didn't exist is because it turns out for startups, the Pentagon is a really awful customer. Most Pentagon contracts take between 18 to 24 months to be let. And if you're a startup raising multiple rounds of venture funding, uh, you can't show profitability to your investors in time. So that timescale simply doesn't work for startups. So the most important thing that Raj and I had to do was to figure out a way for the Pentagon's contracting machinery to spin faster. And we got really lucky here because on our staff, was a dynamic young woman named uh, Lauren Daly, who's one of the heroes of the book. She's, uh, when we meet her, she's 29 years old. Her father actually was a tank commander, and her way of serving was to become a civilian in the army and, and become an acquisition specialist. And she was up late at night reading the National Defense Authorization Act, a dictionary-sized law that Congress passes each year to see if there were any new authorities in it that she could use that defense innovation needed. And she, she found a great one, a single sentence in Section 815 of that bill that allowed uh, us to, to radically shorten that time frame to about 30 to 60 days rather than 18 to 24 months. And so once we had that in place, uh, the conventional wisdom began to change in Silicon Valley that, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom was don't do business with the government. In fact, some investors had actually threatened to withdraw support for founders uh, if they decided to enter the government market. Uh, and that that began to change. And I'm, I'm really proud of uh, that early accomplishment uh, at Defense Innovation Unit. And, and to this day, you know, it's really incredible. This this means of contracting has now been used to acquire seventy billion dollars of technology for the Department of Defense. Seventy billion dollars worth of stuff. What kinds of stuff has the Pentagon integrated as a result of the work done by UNIDX? It's some really astonishing technology. So uh, one of the things that DIU uh, early on uh, pioneered was a contract with a company called Joby Aviation that actually make a flying car. It's an electronically powered eVTOL aircraft vertical takeoff. It has a 200 mile range 
and it's now uh, just entered service in the U.S. Air Force. It's uh, being uh, tested at uh, Edwards Air Force Base to uh, explore how it could be used to support uh, Air Force missions. Uh, other astonishing technology like Capella Space, where a young Stanford engineer pioneered a whole new way of doing a synthetic aperture radar. Um, so this is SAR. It's not um, uh, like taking a camera picture. It's not electrical optical. It actually uses radar waves to bounce off the ground, almost like um, you know a bat's uh, sonar. And uh, this system that Capella has on orbit today, thanks to help uh, from Defense Innovation Unit, can spot a basketball from low Earth orbit. And it was used with incredible success, especially in the early days of Ukraine, to provide unclassified imagery to the Ukrainians so they could uh, monitor uh, where uh, the Russians were, were invading. Do you think that these technologies would have been integrated into the military's arsenal if it weren't for the Defense Innovation Unit? Well, I think the shift that we're starting to see that's very important is, uh, and this was Ash Carter's uh, intent by, behind forming not only Defense Innovation Unit, but a, a new way of doing business with startups, was to actually get more young technologists interested in founding companies that venture capitalists would be willing to back that would make whole new technologies. And uh, the, you know, here again, we're, we're just seeing a sea change in the valley. So PitchBook just came out with their annual defense tech uh, report. And they noted that last year there were 627 separate uh, venture deals for defense tech companies uh, in 2023, involving about $35 billion worth of funds uh, in an overall ecosystem of a couple hundred billion dollars of venture money. So this new interest by investors and by people forming companies is going to be incredible to, to, to watch. Uh, and and some, of the, some of the technology they're creating is uh, is really changing how the military runs. You mention in the book some of the other antibodies you faced. It wasn't just the procurement process. You had people trying to block your way in the Pentagon. Uh, you had people in Congress who were not receptive to what you were trying to do. They were the prime military contractors who wanted to keep all the business to themselves. Have those obstacles been overcome? Yeah, the early days of our job, uh, boy, uh, it wasn't easy. We got thrown a lot of curveballs, uh, the biggest of which was two days after Secretary Carter announced uh, uh, Raj and I as the new leadership team at DIU. We heard from a source on Capitol Hill that our entire budget had been cut. Uh, it's a term called zeroized, where they literally write a zero next to your budget. And so rather than having our first trip to Washington be a chance to get to know the uh, acquisition service leads and people we could perhaps work with, uh, it turned into uh, an act of crisis management to figure out who on earth would, would want to cut our budget and, and why. Um, and while this was all going on, our credit cards, our government credit cards stopped working because uh, somebody wasn't very happy with uh, the new unit uh, being taken out of their chain of command. So yeah, there, there was some interesting moments in those early days. And do are those are those problems still there? I do know that the Pentagon has started something called Replicator Initiative. Maybe you can tell us about that and tell me whether that represents a sea change in the Pentagon's approach to innovation and technology. Well, I'm, I'm really thrilled to say that um, after um, a lot of years of showing success, of showing the ability to put innovative technology in the hands of the warfighter and to, and to build this whole new ecosystem of companies and investors, that uh, this past year, Congress made a Defense Innovation Unit permanent. They actually wrote uh, the unit and its reporting chain to the secretary into law, into the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, which is an extraordinary vote of confidence, I think, in DAU. And an even bigger vote of conference, uh, confidence is that Congress appropriated just under a billion dollars for DIU's, DIU's budget. And uh, as we are seeing with the Replicator Initiative, which is a, a major shift, it's an attempt by the department to quickly and inexpensively build uh, swarming drones um, that uh, initiative is presently being run by Defense Innovation Unit under, under the close uh, uh, eye of, of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Deputy Secretary Kath Hicks. 
Do you think AI is going to be absolutely transformational? I think it, it not only uh, will be, I think uh, for the U.S. military, it, it has to be. And I say that because, you know, a, a lot of con- countries have the ability to build hardware. Uh, you know, we now have global supply chains, right, that stretch uh, primarily in the Asia Pacific uh, that are producing lower cost micro, uh, microelectronics than ever before. But uh, right now, uh, the United States has a unique national lead in uh, almost all aspects of artificial intelligence. If you look at the top companies making the latest generative AI models, they're they're all here in the United States. So I think that uh, what that tells me is that AI really is going to be our strategic advantage, and we're going to have to leverage it to the hilt, and that over time could be decisive. The Chinese are clearly devoting a lot of time, effort, and money to the development of AI. Are they nipping at our heels? Well, I, I think um, you know it, it's uh, uh, clear for all to see that the uh, Chinese military uh, is getting uh, more sophisticated. In fact, President Xi announced his own policy of uh, what's called civil military fusion. That uh, much in the same way that Defense Innovation Unit now is accessing technology from American startups under the policy of civil military fusion, Chinese companies must make their technology available to the military. So uh, the Chinese are also now looking uh, to integrate low-cost, uh, cutting-edge emerging technology into their forces. So this is the strategic competition that we're in, and uh, it's clearly uh, a very intense one uh, and one that uh, uh, is urgent that we, we, we uh, pay a lot of attention to. What about our allies? Are they following suit? Are they investing a lot in innovation? Well, there have been some positive developments. So uh, NATO, for example, now has a uh, fund uh, uh, called Diana that is meant to uh, fund advanced research projects. They also have their own venture capital fund now, the NATO Innovation Fund, which is capitalized by a billion euros that 22 nations in NATO have joined together uh, to to form. In fact, my co-author, Rod Shaw, is the American observer on their board. So there are, I think, important... Uh, reforms and uh, uh, that our allies are 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 now uh, following to try and access the same commercial technology that Defense Innovation Unit was founded to to, to go after. SCSP has identified 2025 to 2030 timeframe as being crucial for U.S. competitiveness. Are you on the same page? And if so, why is this the critical window? Well, I, I think you know if you go back to the um, uh, issue of of the tanks now, the M one A one tanks having to be pulled back from the front in Ukraine. I mean, that's a really dramatic development in in, in military history potentially, and um, we're seeing other very significant changes. So, for instance, um, hypersonic weapons right are starting to be uh, produced and potentially used, and we have very few defenses against them. So it could be that um, as hypersonic weapons come onto the battlefield, our aircraft carriers and our large service ships simply can't um, fight in the way that they uh, would have. So uh, these are big developments, and they're happening now, and and they're certainly going to keep happening uh, with a lot of rapidity. Um, So I I am in strong concurrence with the CSP's view um, that 2025 to 2030 is an absolutely crucial window uh, a kind of almost make or break moment uh, where either we will find ways to um, uh, innovate um, or or we will fall behind. You mentioned hypersonics. We aren't fielding one at the moment. What are the other gaps? Well, some really important steps have already been taken. And one of the most dramatic uh, is in the Air Force today with uh, what's called the uh, CCA, the Combat Collaborative uh, Aircraft. So uh, under the leadership of Secretary Frank Kendall, the Air Force is actually buying 10,000 supersonic drones that will be able to fight alongside uh, manned fighter aircraft. And it's fascinating. You know, you would imagine that uh, a supersonic drone, a stealth drone would be uh, in the sweet spot, a lot of the traditional military contractors. But the two companies that are now a finalist for 
this contract. One is Anderol, one of the new entrants uh, that was invented after Defense Innovation Unit uh, began. And the other is another non-traditional player named General Atomics. So already uh, we're seeing um, uh, major, I mean, this, this is a very significant change in, in Air Force doctrine uh, to take advantage of these new technologies and use them in combination with some of our existing uh, weapon systems. What are some other gaps that need to be filled, though? Well, uh, uh, the thing about emerging technology is that uh, it's a broad class of things. So um, I, I think uh, uh, any any change, and this is what Defense Innovation Unit under the leadership of Doug Beck is, is focusing on now under Replicator, any technology change that would demonstrably uh, give our forces uh, an advantage in uh, O plans and operational plans that uh, we would follow if, if uh, unfortunately, a conflict broke out. And uh, uh, so I, you know, I, I'm very hopeful that uh, more big changes uh, like the Air Force's shift in doctrine to have, have 10,000 supersonic drones fly collaboratively uh, will be coming to, to the other military services in time. Not so very long ago, Silicon Valley was really reluctant to work with the Pentagon, particularly after the Snowden leaks. Has that totally changed or is there still some resistance? Well, you know, Silicon Valley uh, is a big place. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, people who work in it. And uh, just like any group of Americans, uh, they have a variety of uh, views of, of political beliefs. And, you know, we have to remember that, um, you know, so few people in our country serve in the military. And um, many Americans don't actually know one someone who serves in the military, in part because, um, you know, uh, there are no more military bases here in the Bay Area. There's, there's uh, uh, you know, as part of the BRAC process to reduce the number of bases, uh, there used to be a large uh, military population here in the, Bay, in, in, in the Bay Area, and now there's not. So I, I think, though, we have seen a lot of progress. So um, there were, you know, under uh, our leadership, uh, significant protest to something called Project Maven, which was an attempt to apply uh, machine learning algorithms uh, by Google and about 15 other uh, uh, companies to um, better label uh, surveillance uh, footage uh, coming off uh, a variety of aerial pl platforms. But of course, you know, since that protest, um, you know, the world has changed and and not for the better. People have watched, you know, a land war begin on the border with NATO. They've seen what happened in Israel on the 7th of October. So I think now in Silicon Valley, there's a much greater willingness to um, understand that uh, security is a fragile thing and that uh, you can work uh, on it in, in, a, in a company um, uh, in, 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 you know, moral and, and responsible and ethical ways. Do you think that the ethical guidelines currently in place are sufficient? You know, the Department of Defense has um, some really strong guardrails in its AI policies that presently, uh, for instance, require there to be a human in the loop of any uh, system that uh, might uh, uh, be involved in a, a lethal uh, uh, strike. So, uh, and that's that's really important that that we carefully evaluate and understand um, how we should how we should not use uh, some of these new technologies. Um, but but this is all and this is something I think it's important to explain uh, to people in Silicon Valley. Um, the whole point of having uh, a military with a technology that is better than our adversaries is that uh, that actually. Uh, ideally prevents war from breaking out in the first place. It deters war. War is such an awful thing, particularly now with some of these very new powerful uh, weapon systems. And we should do everything we can to ensure it never breaks out, particularly between great powers, which uh, would be devastating if it happened. Elon Musk, as you've mentioned, uh, has his Starlink system in operation over Ukraine, and it's been critical but there are some people who have grown uncomfortable with the idea of putting so much power over national security in the hands of a civilian. Does it bother you? Do you think there's a risk that private industry becomes too big a player? Well, it's an unprecedented situation, and it's all part of the shift in technology that Ash Carter foresaw by founding Defense Innovation Unit. He 
uh, realized that uh, you know at the end of the Cold War, uh, federal research and development money essentially uh, stayed flat. Uh, where at the same time the the tech economy just exploded, companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, uh, and uh, their collective uh, market capital, uh, the size of, of of their market capital uh, is now, um, you know, it really dwarfs the the traditional military uh, contractors, military industrial complex, such that um, the uh, market cap of any single one of those companies now Nvidia as well. Is bigger than the entire defense sector combined. So that shows you that the locus of innovation has shifted now uh, very firmly to the commercial sector. And uh, Elon Musk's Starlink system is a dramatic example of what that uh, uh, technology system can produce. Um, a technology that in almost any other context would be built in government labs, but because of this shift in innovation, um, it's, it's uh, under the control of a private individual. And and that does indeed raise some some novel policy issues that I know, um, you know, the White House and the Department of Defense uh, are working very closely with uh, Elon Musk and his team to to work out. Do you have a point of view? Well, uh, I I think uh, what Elon Musk has has done for the Ukrainian uh, people is extraordinary. Um, it's uh, uh, you know, but for his intervention, um, the uh, rapid uh, turnabout that uh, uh, they were able to achieve by by repelling a much larger military uh, it simply wouldn't have happened. But you know, it wasn't just uh, Starlink. Um, companies like Microsoft were essentially also put on war fo- footing to defeat uh, uh, very sophisticated cyber attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure. Uh, An Amazon Snowball, a giant hard drive, was used to back up uh, ten years of tax and property records and and fly it out of Kiev. So we're seeing a variety of companies now in the private sector uh, playing these extraordinary roles now in in modern conflict. And and that goes to my question, which is, are we ceding too much power to private industry when it comes to national security? I don't think so. I think that private industry is going to be um, the the game changer that uh, uh, we want to harness. And uh, sure, uh, there are some specific and uh, uh, per, you know uh, uh, command and control decisions that uh, Elon Musk um, uh, uh, did take by by preventing the extension of uh, Starlink service, as as Walter Isaacson uh, uh, details in his biography of Musk, and uh, that is indeed uh, uh, unprecedented that a private individual rather than a government is is uh, uh, able to do that. Uh, so so yes, I think there's a lot to talk about here in this space. You wrote in The Atlantic, quote, innovation alone doesn't win wars. Could you expand on that? Well, one of the reasons why the U.S. military has historically been so successful is the training of its people and uh, also uh, its command and control system, something called commander's intent that um, assumes uh, people in the field uh, in uh, crisis situations um, are going to make better decisions Um, trying to fulfill the uh, commander's intent rather than um, uh, sort of being micromanaged in a, in a, in a crisis. So there are, there are many other aspects of what makes the military successful. Uh, It's not just innovation, but I think now uh, uh, innovation absolutely has to be in the mix. Uh, Innovation from commercial, from this new wave of commercial companies and the lower cost systems that are becoming uh, a core part, I think of, of what the military, how the military will fight, um, how, how the military is fighting today, um, how the Ukrainian military is fighting, how the Israeli military is fighting, and, and how the United States military will, will fight in the future. Christopher Kirchhoff, thanks for joining us. The book is called Unit X, How the Pentagon and Silicon Valley are Transforming the Future of War. And thank you for listening to Natsec Tech, a podcast from the Special Competitive Studies Project. We hope you'll listen again. I'm Jean Meserve. Take care.